Rachel and I'm not quite as tall as Brian and also I'm suffering quite a bit today. I've got a chest infection and I've got a mouth abscess. So the conversation I had a couple of days ago when I started to get the chest infection was that someone told me, well, you know, you really can't do this talk. You should cancel. Um, I have a son with autism. Now, my sister also has a son with Asperger's. And I phoned her and I went, oh, yeah, so and so said I should cancel. And she laughed riotously down the phone. And I laughed with her. And the reason that we both laughed is because when you're dealing with a child or a family member with autism, there is no cancel. There is no can't. There is no I don't feel like it. There is no I need more sleep. It just doesn't exist. And it's because you're dealing with one of these bean jigsaws. I've been had autism described to me as being given five of these bean jigsaws from different manufacturers in a carrier bag, had them jiggled and then handed back to you and gone, you need to find which bits you've got. And it's not a sexy science, unlike the delectable Brian Cox, who is very sexy. So it doesn't attract the money of something like genetics or nanobots for you to wipe out populations of these tiny kids. It's not sexy like that at all. It's really actually quite boring and dull and involves quite a lot of hunting for something that doesn't technically exist. Now, media views. This might be your view of autism, although I class it as a personality disorder, but you know, that's me. Um, or possibly this gentleman. Or this young guy. You may have seen on Britain's Got Talent doing incredible things and then coming off and barely being able to speak afterwards. But they aren't the norm, they are exceptions. And I've got a little helper with a reward bag who's going to come and help me now. And there's a chocolate reward in this for you. It's positive reinforcement. Who can tell me a symptom of autism? Sorry? Lack of eye contact. Sean Chocolate there? Somebody else? Basic lack of empathy. Basic lack of empathy. No chocolate for you. Anybody else? <laughs> no chocolate for you. Anybody else? No chocolate for you. Anyone else? It's a time moving, a faster rate experience of things. No chocolate for you. <laughs> and the only reason you've got chocolate was because you think so. If you just said lack of eye contact, there'd have been none for you. Anybody else? Difficulty with communication. Difficulty with communication, none for you. Anybody? No? Okay, Sean, can you just pass the chocolates around everybody? Everybody gets one. I'm not going to be mean. <laughs> I did bring enough, I think. All these symptoms that you are describing occur in you. How many of you are autistic? Just the one back there. Hi! Hello there! I'm going to catch you and torment you later. They occur in all of us. These variations of symptoms occur in every single one of us. But we're not autistic. Oh, well, I probably am, but there we go. That's a completely different story of some quite dodgy scales that get issued around the place, but there we go. So first you need, well, I've done the road. You need to understand what autism is. And we call it an umbrella disorder. It covers Asperger's, ASD, and the complicated one at the end there is pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. Which means we don't know in longhand. And my pictures have gone. And it goes along a spectrum from the low end to a high, this has gone all wrong, this is the wrong way, sorry. It should be low functioning, down that end, Decana's classic in the middle, and Asperger's or high functioning at the top. So it's this progressive line, but it doesn't actually work like that. They have overlap, and that's not a very good diagram because there's overlap from strong symptoms, to high IQ or low IQ to strong symptomology, it just can't be categorised. So coming back to the umbrella thought, this is where I get my umbrella. We think of autism 
as a collection of symptoms. And these symptoms cover these disorders. So then, as we're being covered by this little umbrella, we start looking for what causes it. But we're looking at our little umbrella the wrong way. We should be looking at it this way. I don't know if any of you can read with my fantastic art skills there. It's supposed to paint at three o'clock this morning. But these say, oh, it's peeling. Genetics, birth injury, environmental, developmental, oh, I'm not even sure what that says, infection, nutrition. We've found the causes of autism and we found them in all these things. Because autism doesn't really exist. The symptoms of autism exist and they cause us a problem. But this one thing called autism isn't there. It's just a name we give to an expression we see. Oh, yeah, and dealing in autism. Apparently, when I walked out to the labour ward with my son, someone gave me a magic potion or a babel fish that let me understand all these terminologies. Just, you know. And I go into my first couple of meetings with people dealing in autism, experts in autism, and I'm suddenly meant to be an expert almost immediately. And the more the time went on, I realised that the experts weren't experts. They were spending millions upon millions of pounds looking for this thing called autism that isn't really there and trying to find biomarkers or environmental toxins or all these things that could have caused it so they can stop it and were doing nothing that made any difference whatsoever to my life they were doing nothing that had to stop you know they could help me when i'm having to clean up poo at two o'clock in the morning on a regular basis, or nothing that would help me stay awake when I've had two hours sleep a night for three, four years-ish, and no training for me. If I was a professional carer, I would be sent on every course under the sun, but as a parent, I have another sort of babel fish that makes me automatically able to deal with some quite strange behaviour, and that's not true either. So we're back to the beans. All this money we're spending isn't helping people with autism. It's helping a lot of researchers get a really good name for themselves in investigating something that causes so much pain to people. But not a lot of researchers are down there doing behavioural training for parents. They're not down there providing speech interventions. And a few psychologists have discovered that parents actually make good trainers. They can not only provide that intervention to their own children, but they're really good at training everybody else in the care team to provide it. But we don't do that either. We have professional patient people with chronic conditions, where we train them to manage their own condition, but we don't have a professional parent, where we train parents to deal with their children's difficult behaviour. And the thought I want to leave you with is that we should know, firstly, when we're spending research money, what it is we're looking for. And if we're not going to find a cause for autism, which we aren't, why are we spending the money? And the second thing we should always think about when we're doing research is who's going to use it? Because when I do autism research, I write in quite an informal style because I want a parent to be able to go onto the internet, find my paper and go, I can use that. That will make a difference to my life. Whereas no biomarker ever will. Thank you. <laughs>